many thanks for choosing us. After many years of bloodshed on Ghana's roads through road accidents, there seemed to be some action to deal with the deaths and injuries. This afternoon, a national consultative forum is underway to try and deal with the many challenges on Ghana's roads. Some proposals have already come up, many of them generating disagreements here and there. We'll bring you a list of some of those proposals shortly and connect with experts to scrutinize them. First, though, Take a look at the road safety situation in the country today. And uh, there on your screens, we look at 2021 accident statistics from January to September. And the number of cases reported is 11,858. Number of persons killed, 2,126. Number of persons injured, and uh, that's over 11,000, stands at 11,659. And these are figures uh, that should not be toyed with. Number of cases reported uh, also is stands at 1,264 for September only. Number of persons killed at 235. A number of persons injured 1,315 just September. In the month of September alone, these are the figures we've recorded on our roads and the year has not ended yet and so we don't know how many more lives we're going to be losing on our roads in august only number of cases reported 1300 number of persons killed 221 number of persons injured 1298 uh, that's the number of people who die on our roads and we're looking at the regional distribution, and it's from January to September. In the greater Accra region, and always the greater Accra region tops, 492. In the eastern, uh, upper e eastern region, we have 357. In the central region, 151. Western region, 91. Ashanti region, 423. And it's closely following the Greater Accra region, Volta region has 84, Northern region has 46. In the Upper West region, you have 37. Upper East region has 77. Uh, Bono region has 70. Bono East, 95. Ahafo uh, region has 56. And Ochi has 15. Savannah region has 72. And uh, West North, Western North has uh, five, uh, 54. And you look at Northeast, that has the least number. Uh, which is six, and you ask yourself, what are they doing right? The reason they are having uh, the least number of people crashing on their roads. Well, the National Consultative Forum on Road Safety has been ongoing all day today. Let's link up live now with my colleague, Michael Papani Ashale, who's covering this event for us. Papani, what's been the reaction to these proposals coming up at the forum? All right, so we've lost Papani there. Papani will join us uh, again. We'll try and get him to join us again. But as we wait for Papani to join us, I want us to ponder over this regional distribution we've just shared with you. And we have Greater Accra and Ashanti region topping up. And always, always, it's been these two regions. I mean, partly because there's so many people in, the, in those regions, but what else is accounting for these crashes on our roads? These are issues we need to be thinking about as we join those aspects who are reviewing our road safety regulations. Because in the Eastern region, you have 357. I'm not surprised about that. But look at Northeast. It has six people. So we need to learn some lessons from these regions. Papani is back on the line. Papani, what's been the reaction to these proposals coming up at the forum? Proposals coming through, and some of them uh, are very contentious. Uh, some of the stakeholders are around, all those interested parties here are not happy about them. Let's take, for instance, the... Uh, uh, the, the first and foremost one that came up was on producing your license on request. So the, the new, the old law says that you are required to produce your license on the request of an officer. Uh, in the law, the caveat is that you either produce it on the spot or within 24 hours. However, the new uh, uh, revision says 
you are supposed to provide it immediately that is on the spot. Many of the people here who are here to contribute to the review process uh, definitely did not like that aspect of the law that says they are supposed to provide it immediately. But the Minister for Transport uh, of Ofori, Isiyama, gave them an answer that you cannot be uh, um, doing a job without having anything to, 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 to prove that uh, you stand in that capacity. So on, on that, the, the minister seems emphatic that you have to hold your license, uh, be it wherever you are. One of the biggest of the challenges that the drivers have been with the production of the license was to the effect that some of the officers that take your license do use that uh, as leverage over you to get you to do what they want you to do. And more often than not, they get you to uh, come along with them to their police stations or get to, in some situations, they allege that they are extorted in some of those instances. The superintendent over here who was representing the um, MP, that it takes a particular category of persons within the police department to confiscate your license from you. It really did not end without some of the All right, so Papani, uh, there are concerns about the kind of licenses, uh, the kind of people we give license to. There are concerns about uh, people's attitude on our roads. There are concerns about the law enforcement agencies, the uh, MTTU, and all of these uh, issues are issues that have been raised uh, that needs to be addressed. How are the experts at this forum handling this? Well... So, Aisha, some of the experts here want a middle ground. For, for that on the license, they want it to go back to the old. You either produce it on the spot or giving a maximum of 24 hours to produce that. But that's not the only conversation that has been happening here. Uh, there's one of the regulations that proposes to license the activities of, uh, to regulate, I beg your pardon, the activities of privately owned vehicles that are being used for ride hailing services, particularly what we are seeing uh, with people using their, their private cars uh, um, to do more of a sort of commercial uh, um, business. The law mentioned that it was going to be looking at regularizing those activities and going to ask them to put up stickers that were going to show to the effect that they were uh, in this category of vehicles. There was one hint from one of the drivers who mentioned that uh, if, if the situation is not checked, that is the operations of ride hailing services using privately owned vehicles, they as taxi unions were also going to be looking at possibly venturing into importing cars, not painting them the required commercial vehicle um, colors, and will also use them to or, or do the commercial business without necessarily having to paint them the traditional red and yellow colors. Uh, one of the issues that also came up, which the drivers have vehemently opposed, is the change of the towing uh, procedures. The law assistance, and that is the LI that we are discussing this morning, and this afternoon, I beg your pardon, is to the effect that the towing services will be done by DVL in the effect government, and drivers will be required to pay some fees to the DVLA. The proposed law actually mentions that you would have to cater for that on your own as a driver or as a person who owns a vehicle. So when your vehicle breaks down anywhere in Ghana, you'd have to cater for the towing service. They're going to enforce that by making sure that when you go to the DVLA to renew your roadworthy certificate for your vehicle, they were going to demand that as one of the requirements. Without that, uh, uh, um, any, any documentation to the fact that you have subscribed to a private or any towing service within the country, then you will not be issued the certificate, the roadworthy certificate. So, Aisha, these are some of the topical things that have come up. The drivers have not liked the last one that I mentioned. The, the suggestion that they are mentioning is that we should go back, we should, we should stick to what the law says. Some of them, the minister in particular, mentioned that the, he referenced the fact that at the time of bringing in the 2012 law, some of the drivers did not like it and pushed back at it that they didn't want government to be in the space of towing vehicles to the effect that they have to pay money to it. What they want is for government now to stick to that law because according to them, putting it within the private space this makes them vulnerable to exploitation. 
from the privately owned towing service. So Aisha, this will be one of the biggest of the conversations that have come up so far, but it's one of the few things that have also been discussed here this afternoon. Papani, so um, after all these proposals and suggestions that have come up at this forum, what would you say are the takeaways? Hello, Papani. Yes, so I'm saying that what, are, what would you say are the takeaways uh, which will, um, you know, perhaps affect the outcome of this meeting? Great. So some of the takeaways from this will be uh, what the drivers in the, at the end of the day when, when they go for their last consultative meeting, what would be their final stance on the licensing aspect? You have to produce a license within 24 hours or on the spot. The police makes a strong case that taking it on the spot usually helps them to end the, the menace of having people driving and just making excuses of I've left my licenses at home. That and including the clamping down or, or regularizing the activities of the folks who are uh, uh, going to be using their privately owned vehicles for ride hailing services. I said, well, if you're carrying passengers, it has to be regularized. The minister is hopeful that these laws at the end of the world, these proposed laws will clamp down on the number of deaths that we have witnessed this year. And the number stands as more than 2,000 people who have lost their lives just uh, in three quarters of the year 2021. Papani is our man monitoring that consultative meeting on road safety for us. And we have key points from this uh, meeting uh, for you. We'll share with you. And uh, the old law uh, says that a driver should provide their license upon request immediately or within 24 hours. The proposal that went for this forum that people, uh, experts all over came around to discuss is the driver should actually provide the license immediately and not within 24 hours. Concerns by drivers say the drivers fear their licenses will be confiscated by the arresting officers. Indeed, this has been an issue uh, of contention, I mean, for some time now. Uh, so drivers are asked to bring their licenses and they are protesting because they think the police will take the license and will never give it back to them. Now, there's this one, intention to regulate privately owned cars used for uh, ride hailing services. And the example is Uber, Bolt, and the rest. Now, some stakeholders seem to like that idea. And uh, that's from the meeting today. If you come to towing, and Papani spoke about that extensively, the old law says regulation 102 uh, of the old law, it says the drivers will pay a fee to the DVLA for towing. The proposal that is coming uh, for discussion is for the drivers to be responsible for their own towing. So, I mean, this, if it is accepted by aspects at the consultative forum, will form the new or revi the revision that we'll be doing to the road regulation law currently in operation. So, I mean, uh, after this uh, road consultative uh, forum, it is hopeful that something will come out uh, that would indeed ensure sanity on our roads. And we all look forward to that. Of course, we'll be sharing assets and details of the outcome of that forum with you. We take a break on the polls. The polls is brought to you by Global uh, Digni Lu Safe Sanitation. And also, you can join the conversation via all our social media handles. Tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. We are back in the GG. Welcome back to the polls. And of course, we'll be going back to the uh, conversation about road safety because there's a big meeting out there trying to resolve and also make reforms to the old uh, Road Regulation Act to ensure our roads are clean. We'll bring you that conversation because we're going to be moving forward from where we've been throughout uh, the period and also look for the way forward in dealing with with the situation as we wait for that conversation though and you would also get the opportunity to join the conversation by sending us comments and suggesting as to how 
you want this issue dealt with. But before that, what will you do if you were pressed and needed to urgently use the washroom at a lorry terminal but cannot find one? The answer to that question has been the daily reality of drivers and passengers who use the main circle lorry station. The station which serves as a transit point for thousands of people has no functioning toilet facility. Passengers are forced to use a makeshift urinal at a fee. The urinal itself has become a breeding place for mosquitoes. Visitors are welcomed with a pungent smell. Today, sanitation officers of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly shut down the facility with an order for the immediate construction of the washroom. Manuel Corantin was with the team and has come through with this report. What you are saying is what I don't want to listen because you still use the facility. Heated exchanges between AMA sanitation officers and a urinal operator are the main bus terminal of the Kwame Nkrumah interchange. The washroom in question is the only functioning place of convenience in the yard, serving tens of thousands of passengers and drivers who use the station as a transit point. Where is your toilet facility for here? In case so, a passenger gets here and then he has a problem and he wants to attend nature's call, where does he go? Because you are supposed to have that here. Yes, these ones even were made by ourselves. When the station was uh, rehabilitated, they didn't provide those things. Well, across the road, there are two toilets there. For here, we don't have it. It has become breeding grounds for diseases and attacks patrons with a pungent smell. A recent head of Environmental Health Unit of the AMA, Joseph Asetanga, ordered its closure. These are urinals, both for gents and then ladies. The stench that is coming out from here is so unbearable. And they take 20 pesos upon urinal. Any individual who comes to urinate here, 20 pesos. Let's multiply the population per day, per the transit of passengers here. That you sit here to take money and you cannot use and keep this place tidy. And you expect us to allow you to continue operating this urinal. now. So you can, you can, the cameraman should shoot here and see. You take money economically, make profit, and you feel like you are making the profit and nobody cares to come here. I will not manage the place. I will keep the place in order. But the operator of the facility disagreed with the directive. She denied any wrongdoing. Daddy, Daddy, we have been cleaning this place. We have a chemical that we use to clean this place every single morning. In fact, I clean this place to the extent that one gentleman asked me why I like to work so much. So it's not as if we don't clean here. We actually do. Oh, I no pay me paper on my paper two times. So now I'm just adding our crown. Who pay you, master? While this progresses, passengers and drivers alike who use the park want the immediate construction of a proper toilet facility for them. big but no toilet. step out too much. Unless we go to the roadside. We are really suffering. We have to cross the road all the way to the other side before we can get a public toilet. They should help build one here for us. It's very difficult for us here. There's no place of convenience for us. We have to cross the road before we get a place to ease ourselves. The authorities must help us to get a dedicated toilet facility here. They have to help us and as you get one, one toilet at this station. If you want to do toilet, you, you have to cross the road before you go to toilet. So we are, we are begging them to find toilet here for us.
So uh, we are still talking about transportation. We're talking about what happens on our roads. Because after many years of bloodshed on Ghana's roads through road accidents, there seem to be some action to deal with the deaths and injuries. This afternoon, the National Consultative uh, Forum is underway to try and deal with the many challenges on Ghana's roads. And of course, there are a lot of statistics that I've shared with you. I want us to look at it again. The reason why this conversation is very crucial. Number of cases reported from January to September alone, 2021. You look at it and it starts from the reported cases stands as 11,858. Number of persons killed. And I want you to look at this statistic very carefully. 2,126 people are dead on our roads between January and September. That's less than a year. Number of persons injured alone on our roads stand at 11,659. This is not something we should joke with. And in the studio with me to do this conversation, of course, I've shared this already with you. In September alone, you have 1,264 people uh, cases of accidents reported september just one month a number of persons killed in just one month is 235 this is even higher than the people killed by covid in a month number of persons injured 1315 and kwabna osei who is a road safety advocate has joined me in the studio to do more on this uh so say thanks so much for your time. Mm -hmm. You are coming from the consultative forum, yes. uh, which the biggest forum to deal with all these challenges on our roads. Share with me highlights of this meeting. Okay. Our main concern is uh, their intention to amend regulation 134 of the current regulation. Okay. Yes. And regulation 134 simply states that any bus must have two, at least two exits. Okay. And it must be placed on the right side, where in the local plan, parlance we call it uh, driver side. Okay. It goes further to say is that if there is no exit at the rail, mm. there should be an emergency exit on the left side. Okay. This law has been standing in our statutory books since 1974. Okay. And DVLA, DVLA and other, stakeho other stakeholders have woefully failed to implement this law. So I had cause to take, to institute a legal action against them. So the court compelled them to start implementing the law. Mm. And all of a sudden, they want to amend the law. And I asked them why they want to amend the law. They said they wanted to meet, to meet international standards and again, to meet manufacturer specification. Okay. But I shut it down because since we started advocating in around 2010, okay. we've got VIP to contact the uh, Scania manufacturers, and they've now provided two, two entrances at the right side mm -hmm. and an emergency exit on the left. Okay. Again, Ghana Education Service and uh, Ghana Education Service of, of Education, for the past two years, all the vehicles they've imported have emergency exit. Yep. Just last week, I went to O and A's uh, station, and I realized that the Kia Grand, Kia Grand bed buses they've imported from South Korea, all of them have emergency exit. Mm -hmm. Again, New Plan in Kumasi have started creating this emergency exit for them. And uh, Dr. Bemunua, the vice president, donated some bus to Ghana School of Law. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student there. I prevailed upon the transport officer. They took their bus to Kumasi, and they, have, they, they provided emergency exit for them. So uh, what the Minister of uh, Transport is saying, it's non-starter. Mm. It's non-starter. OK, so uh, is, it that, is it only this a part of the law that is going to be revealed? And what is the reason of the ministry uh, wanting to reveal this? Have they given you any reason yet? As I said, they said they want it to meet international standards and, well, and manufacturer specification. Okay. And I've shot the manufacturer speci specification down. And uh, in regards to the international standards, I don't think we should take the thing wholesale. We should tailor it to suit our condition. Yep. This is a situation 
I, I even send them some videos of a bus that had been involved in an accident, and the persons were being pulled through the windows. But they failed to show, uh, to show the video today. I insisted, but they said no. Okay. Because they didn't want the public to know what is happening. Mm. In fact, I had information that this, uh, this transport owners have been lobbying government to scrap this very law. So I wasn't surprised when they came out uh, to say that they are going to scrap this law. Mm. And, and replace it with what? One door. That long bus, one door. Wow. And, and how are and they, your they are, other colleagues they, reacting to this? That's why I'm here. I, I, I think the argument I, I, I raised there, everybody was happy. They would claim they would, they would provide hammers. And I, I'm telling them that if you provide hammers and you provide exit at the rooftop, they should be complementary to the door. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, hammers, the hammers have warned them. If they're not careful, the slightest mishap, people start breaking the, the, the windows, mm -hmm. and the, it will create problem between the owners and the passengers therein. Mm. Again, someone who is traumatized, do you expect that person to jump down from that level to the ground floor? Yeah. I just don't understand. In fact, because when STC imported, we're about to import these 100, latest 100 buses, I wrote to them to ensure that it meets specification. Mm. They came, they imported the vehicles with that specification. So I, I wrote to DVLA that they shouldn't touch the bus. But strangely, they lances the bus. And I was in the process of mobilizing money to sue them for contempt, to cite them for contempt. In fact, yesterday, just yesterday, I went to my lawyer and I've collected my five. Because my lawyer is, for political reasons, he doesn't want to handle that very case. But another lawyer is prepared to handle the case. So maybe in the course of the week, I'll send the, uh, the brief to him so that we, we cite Attorney General DVLA STC for content. But but you've you've raised this issue at yes, the they, forum. Yes, they are, and, and, uh, they are aware too. Do you know whether I mean it's something because I mean they have invited people yes. to bring an input into the new law. So as you've uh, taken your concerns, uh, definitely uh, it's something that they should they should, yes, they, they should they deal said, with. They are said, you having a they said we, 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 we should we should hold on and that there will be further consultation. But as, as I said. I had an insider information that these people had lobbied the government. And when I realized, when I, I got to know that this thing was coming, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised. They've, in fact, lobbied the government to change the law so that it suits them. Fancy a bus carrying 40 people with only one exit. Mm. And unfortunately, fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, these exits are usually at the front. So at the slightest impact, and some of them are automatic, at the slightest impact, it gets locked. Mm. It gets locked. Okay. And these people have to find their way out. The pictures I saw, if the, if, uh, the bus had caught fire, all the people have, would have perished. And nobody seems to care. Last time I told the minister that maybe, excuse me, because you don't board some of these buses, you don't have feeling for the ordinary bus. And he asked me to retract the statement. You know, I, in fact, I retracted it reluctantly. Mm. But that's a fact. Okay. That's a so, fact. Okay, so this is one issue which you wish to take yes. up in court. Yes. And in, in the coming days, I mean, exactly when would you take up this matter in court? In fact, I had wanted to see something positive during the, the meeting. The, during the meeting. Mm. But looking at things, I think I have to act fast. Okay. Even, even if they pass this law, I'll go, I'll go back to court based on the human rights issue. Because you can't come 40 or 50 people in one compartment and provide them with a single door. I think it valid Article 15 of the 1992 Constitution. Okay. Yes. And Look. I cited it in my writ. Okay. I cited it in my writ. And the mm. court found sense in what I said. Mm. But um, you, you said DVLA was instructed to ensure yes. that uh, that law was respected. Re yes. And, and you also stated that the Ministry of Education, the buses that they've, they've, brought, they've, they've, they've brought they all recently. have, have emergency, emergency exits. Exit. So yes. uh, this in a way shows that probably they are actually implementing it, isn't it? <laughs> they are not implementing it. I went to court in 2011. Okay. And I think in 2017, there was, a, there was an out of court settlement and they told them to do this. They do did this. This. But as I speak, 2021, they are still registering buses with, with one, one exit. exit. Mm. In fact, I, I didn't go to court early because I wanted to mobilize money. Now I'm financially sound. I'm going. Okay. I'm going to go. If even I have to go for a loan for this exercise, I will do exactly the same. Okay. We, we wish you well in this exercise. But let's also look at some of the issues that were deliberated upon at the, um, 
the forum for you what are the critical uh, my, issues my, my other area of there? interest was with, with this retroflective tips that yellow tips the strips around vehicles mm. as the law stands now uh, vehicles with more than 3.5 vehicles with a tonnage of 3.5 are supposed to be strapped but i said no we should they should bring the tonnage down so that it can cater for something like Hyundai Grace, the category. Mm. Because the intention is that when the car develops a problem on the road, we should be able to push it to safety. Okay. So if the law should stand as it, as, 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 as it stands now, mm. it means some, some vehicles like Splinter, it shouldn't have those trips around, around them. them. And I tell, I'm telling you, it has saved a lot of lives, this retrograde, because in the night it makes the car very conspicuous. Mm. So I had wanted them to reduce the tonnage, but somehow yeah. I think they will consider it. Mm. I think they will consider it. Okay. Um, consider it. And talking about the reflectives uh, that is helping deal with some of the accidents, yeah. there's also the bit about cars that are involved in accidents that are left on the road yes. unattended to. And I know that also came up there, the towing yes. bit. What, what was the discussion at the meeting? Yes. I wrote a proposal to National Road Safety Commission, I think 2010 or 2011. In fact, this issue of even the towing exercise was my baby. Okay. It was my baby. But somewhere along the line, they brought the private sector in. I told them that this very issue, it borders on safety. And especially those whose cars are broken down, it's not the one they kill. It's, they are innocent third parties. Mm. So the government should intervene. They brought in Zoom Lion with this big, big trust. And what I said played out. Because someone car will develop a problem, you tow it to safety. You can't retrieve the money from that person. You will not even see him. That's why some, some cars develop problems. Sometimes it stays on the road for a, a month or two. So our contention is that the government should absorb it, absorb this thing. Whether, I don't know how they will do it. I think they can collaborate with the insurance companies who are the ultimate beneficiaries mm. to implement this exercise. Mm. All right. So, um, for, so you think that what they are proposing there is not what will resolve our issues? They, they claim before you register a car, that is their proposal. You, re register. you, have, to, you have to register with an insurance company mm. or I think a towing service. Okay. But someone may register in Accra. You know, this towing service, they are not spread nationwide. The fact that I've registered my car in Accra does not preclude me from taking my car to Boko. Yeah. So if it's a national thing now, in Boko, they'll have that services there in Tamale, they'll have that service there. In Axim, they'll have that service there. That's why I want the private sector. And the private sector, their main objective is for profit. Yeah. And that may compromise safety. So solely government must take up that is That is my... Uh, in the new, I think they're thinking of also the drivers themselves taking responsibility of uh, this towing and all that, or the car owners. Yeah, the car owners. And I'm saying that when a car develops a problem on the road, it doesn't kill the car owner. Yeah. It kills people like you Those and myself. Yep. So the government should intervene. Mm. They should find money. Mm. They should find money and implement this. Okay. Um, all those disabled cars from the road. Okay. How they do it, it is left to them. So for you, left to you alone, we should leave what was in the old law untouched. Regards? With regards to towing. The towing, I don't think that they have made provisions. In, in the law. So it's something that we should... Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So... Um, Transport Minister Koko Furi Asiyama has been speaking on this matter. Listen. Good morning to all of you. I want to begin by thanking all of you for making time to join us here today for this all important national consultative forum on road traffic crashes and a review of the Road Safety Act and regulations. Those joining us online via through Zoom, Facebook, and other platforms, I am indeed very grateful that you could find time to be part of this important program. Ladies and gentlemen, nine years ago, the Road Traffic Regulation 2012, LI, 2180 
was passed by Parliament to give effect to the Road Traffic Act 2004 at 683. The regulations were, were fashioned out to replace the 1974 Road Traffic Regulation LI5, LI953, which over time fell short of provisions to address trends in the road transport industry, particularly with respect to road safety. It provided for a more comprehensive regulation of road traffic and road use to ensure safety on our roads, including but not limited to the following. Regulating the registration and licensing regime of motor vehicles, driving schools, and driving instructions. Describing maximum speed limit for motor vehicles of any class or description, and to provide for exemptions in special cases. Prescribing the nature of and procedure for inspection of motor vehicles. Prescribing the specifications and installation of seat beds. Regulating the use of mobile phones while driving a motor vehicle or riding a motorcycle or bicycle on a road. Removal of broken down or disabled or abandoned vehicles. Prescribing procedure to be taken in the interest of safety, security, and convenience of, pu of public traveling in motor vehicles, or otherwise using roads and providing for periodic inspection of motor vehicles. Last but not the least, providing for the payment of sport fines and offenses for which sport fines are levied among others. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years of implementation, a number of issues have been introduced to give effect to regulations. Key among them are one, reforms in the driving licensing administration with the introduction of driver licensing systems and the new vehicle registration systems. These have led to a new workflow and reduction in fraudulent practices as well as revenue leakage. Introduction of Skizai's Road Worldy Certificate to facilitate enforcement and reduce fraudulent practices. Increased funding for the National Road Safety Authority to scale up and safety programs, to scale up road safety programs and activities. Nationwide training program for commercial vehicle drivers. Despite these interventions, it has become apparent that some of the provisions of the regulations need to be reviewed and enhanced where necessary in view of some identified technical and legislative deficiencies as well as implementation challenges that have emerged. It has also become necessary now more than before to introduce new provisions in line with development trends, changing social norms and values, and to ensure conformity with international conventions and ECOWAS protocols on road transport. Ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this National Consultative Forum is twofold. First, as I said, it is an opportunity for all of us to dispassionately discuss the issues on road safety and recommend practical measures to government for adoption and consequent implementation. This forum will also allow the press to devote some time to focus on one of the core issues that matter to, to our listeners, viewers, and readers. Again, and most importantly, it is an opportunity for us to make input and suggestions on proposed amendment to the Road Traffic Act and regulations to ensure effective regulation of the sector and promote safety in the country. 
And you heard the Ofori Siamahi, his transport minister, speaking at uh, the consultative forum to deliberate on the things that happen on our roads and make inputs into revising our road traffic regulations laws. But um, we'll still go back and listen to the DVLA uh, boss, uh, Kwesi Buzia, who's also at that uh, meeting. We'll hear from him. But Kwabna, I understand the passion with which you speak. And I, I want to agree with you because this has some human interest. You can't put people in a long bus the and most. have uh, and just have only one exit yes. point. But also, again, if they want to meet international standards, you and I know that elsewhere, even the enforcement bit is different from the way yeah, we... The response, attend, response to emergency to is very swift. Is, is very swift compared to yes. what we do here in Ghana. What came up with regards to enforcement of our laws at the meeting? Did any, anything uh, uh, of that uh, sort? Uh, as usual, the police were there and people were giving it to them left and right. And they said they are going to take measures to see that the writing is done. But I'm doubtful. Political interference. Did, did, did they enumerate the challenges they have in ensuring that we enforce those beautiful laws that we spend time to put together? Let, let, let me use this to explain what you are saying. There was an issue with police collecting lances from drivers. Mm. The law says uh, before you can detain a driver, a driver lances, the mm. current law, mm. you should be of the rank of inspector and above. Okay. But you all know, any constable or any couple will just, where's your lances? Yeah. And you will take it. Mm -hmm. So if you are not able to enforce, to implement even this, yeah. how much more uh, the bigger one? Okay. Uh, well, let, enforcement let, is a problem. Right. Let's cross over to uh, the event. Uh, Chief Executive um, Office of the DVLA, Kwesi Buzia, is on. Uh, let's hear from him. Honourable Deputy Ministers for Transport, Honourable Adum and Honourable Tampoli, Honourable Kufi Ahankra, Parliamentary Select Committee, Dr. Sesu Mensa, DG MTTD, Madam Mabel Sego, the Acting Director of the Ministry for Transport, the Director for Policy, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation at the Ministry of Transport, Madam Irene Mesiba, important stakeholders, GPRTU, Potua, colleague, CEOs and DGs, senior managers and staff of NRSA, MTTD, NIC, DVLA, friends from the media, general public, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege to be here this morning to participate in this very important exercise. A stakeholder consultative meeting to review sections of the Road Traffic Regulations 2012 LI 2180 to discuss and address implementation challenges and to also take a step back and assess the relevance of some of the regulations and incorporate new and emerging practices in the management of the road transport industry. It is an undeniable fact that road transport plays a critical and central role in every society. Nearly all the goods and services needed for everyday life are transported by road. Daily travel to work, to school, for leisure, and other purposes are largely facilitated by road transport. This movement of people and goods, however, when not carefully managed, come with unimaginable loss to individuals and families, causing immeasurable distress and loss of life. Road traffic crashes not only debilitate families because of the loss of a loved one, but also deny the country of a critical human capital needed for national development and growth. The fact is, risky behaviors of drivers 
associated with road traffic crashes left unchecked do adapt to change in societal dynamics and growth. It is therefore necessary that our road traffic, law, traffic laws, safety laws be updated to be relevant and consequential to the ever-changing times of the transport landscape. Risks such as mobile phone use while driving, unsafe and unregulated speed limits, driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs, general driver inattentiveness, and non-compliance with seat belt and child restraint laws have emerged as some of the leading causes of fatalities in Ghana. You had the DVLA boss um, speaking at the consultative forum. So, uh, Ms. Ose, aside the matter you're taking up in court with regards to emergency exits in our uh, commercial buses, what do you want to see at the end of this consultative forum? Mm, as I said, when you look through uh, the proposed amendment, it is primarily because of this one exit. The others are non-status. Mm. It is primarily because of, of, of this uh, one that exit. That is why you think this yes. whole meeting is yes. ongoing? Yes, because I had prior information that they've lobbied uh, government and that something was in the pipeline. Mm. So when I learned that they were holding this thing, I wasn't surprised. So immediately I got the document, I looked through, and I saw that they wanted to touch 134. So I asked them why. This thing I have not been able to implement, so why should you change it? And they raised this manufacturers and I shut it down. And international standards said, no, if you tell us the thing to suit our conditions, mm. you don't have a response, uh, our uh, response to emergency yep. is it's not zero, it's negative. Mm. And I cited the case of this STC bus which, which was involved in an accident at Commander Junction at 1 a.m. It was not until the following day, the following morning, 6 a.m., that the rescue operation went there. The people would have been dead yes. by the time. The international rescued. standard means immediately there should be a response. Yeah. But this is the situation. We waited for about five or six hours before rescue operation started. So my my major concern is this one one exit, but I'll fight it tooth and nail. I'm grateful for your time and wish you all the best in your effort to get this thing done. We'll give you all the support that you need. Also, this afternoon, the minority is raising red flags over the December 1 deadline handed public sector workers to get their Ghana cards or risk losing their salaries. The Controller and Accountant General's Office in a statement dated 12th of October says it is currently harmonizing its system to ensure speedy administration of government's payroll. All existing and prospective public sector workers have less than three months to acquire the Ghana card. On your screens now, the copy of that statement, and it says, as part of government of Ghana's efforts to deliver speedy, secured, and verified payroll services to government, employees, and pensioners, while reducing the risk of an underserving payments or claims, the Controller and Accountant General's Department is collaborating with the National Identification Authority to have a harmonized database to facilitate biometric and unique identification of all workers on the government payroll. Well, this directive comes at a time when many Ghanaians are already working around the clock to get Ghana cars to re-register their mobile SIM cards. The minority says the December 1 deadline is outrageous. And joining me now on phone is minority spokesperson on employment and social welfare, Dr. Kwabna Donko. Doc, I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. Dr. Kwamna Donko, if you're on, I'm grateful for your time. I appreciate your calling. Doc, uh, government argues that if each public sector worker acquires a Ghana card, payroll fraud will be checked. Isn't that enough reason why you should support this? You see, absolutely. Government, past and present, have attempted to fight payroll. Uh, payroll fraud, and it's a very loud double objective. No one is against that. Let's make that clear. Not a minority or majority in the chamber will be against that because we have raised those issues over a number of years, not just with this government, with past government from the first MDC to the first MPP back to MDC. Consistently, this has been raised. 
as a canker that needs to be killed. It is the dicta, the nature of the implementation that creates its own challenges. The control accountant general is not an elected official. And my argument is that let consulate ministry, the Minister of Employment, for Finance, let them engage, lead public education, the sensitive uh, sensitization uh, drive, let's sensitize our people, let's sensitize the Ghanaian worker. Not just the Ghanaian worker, this even goes beyond the worker, including the pensioner. And it is in the interest of every Ghanaian citizen, whether working or not, for us to judiciously use our tax revenue. And therefore, nobody is against it. But why do I implement such a policy? If you implement a good policy wrongly, the end result tends not to be wrong. So let's get everybody on board. Can you assure me that everybody who wanted the national ID card was able to lay hands on one? My information, and that's what people have called me, is that they couldn't lay hands on it. So first of all, let's do the basics. Let's give ourselves some time that look from, let's say, 1st January. This is going to be the only method of identification or authentication of people on the public payroll. And can you encourage the private sector to do so? Having said that, what are the bottlenecks to workers in particular assessing the national ID card as of today? Let's address that. When we address that and we sensitize the population, the rollout will be smooth, the rollout will be effective, and we will save ourselves money. This is our position. We are not against payroll fraud. Indeed, both sides of the aisle in Parliament have consistently asked that we should work at reducing payroll. Doc, is this something that the public sector workers themselves have expressed uh, to you that they have challenges in doing it? Absolutely. I am, I am a member of parliament for a rural constituency. And if you go on our platform, and then a phone calls I have received, that there are a number of people in my constituency who is working who have not been able to access the national ID card. Remember, the period was fraught with challenges. People go to queue and they tell them the network was down. Remember all those challenges. And I appreciate the effort NIA says they are now um, doing to issue out the cards, but you have to go and pay. For most people, you have to go and pay. And therefore, let's get persons right. We will, we will support every move, every move to reduce payroll fraud, if not eliminate it. And as a nation, we must work to eliminate payroll fraud. However, the process is as important as the objective. So as the uh, minority spokesperson on employment and social welfare and a member of parliament, what do you intend to do about this? Well, Parliament is on racing. I, but even then, I will be talking to the appropriate, especially the Minister of Employment. I will uh, make an attempt to contact him tomorrow and raise the, the issues so that he can also intervene with his colleagues. We are all in support of the move. There's absolutely no well-meaning Ghanaian who will oppose it. But the implementation, the process of implementation, is what we must work at. I'm and of grateful course, when for Parliament resumes and mm. the challenge is over, mm. we'll raise it on the floor of Parliament. I'm grateful for your time. Dr. Kwabna Donko, he is a minority spokesperson on Parliament's committee 
of employ employment and social welfare. The National Communication Authority has approved the licenses of Radio Gold and Radio XYZ for operation. These stations form part of the 131 others who have been authorized to operate subject to some conditions spelled out by the NCA board. This was the outcome of the authority's governing board meeting held on October 11. And uh, there are a number of reasons why uh, this will be done. They've actually given, instructed them to uh, go through some workshop or sensitization workshop. And if they pass through that workshop, they will be able to uh, get their licenses back and operate fully. Uh, let's have a conversation about this because people don't know whether this is good news or bad news. And, and joining me for this conversation is Andrew Danswa Henkwa. He's the president of the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association. Also from Parliament is uh, ABA Fuseni, who is a ranking member on the Communication Committee of Parliament. I'm grateful, gentlemen, uh, for your time. All right, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Nanswa Henkwa. So 131 stations, including Radio Gold, XYZ, and a host of others have received their licenses approved, but that is based on some conditions set out by the NCA. What do you call this, good or bad news? All right, so ABA Fuseni uh, will take that for me whilst we, we wait for Danswa Hinkra to join. Uh, Mr. ABA Fuseni, I'm grateful for your time. I'm asking if uh, this, what, how does this come across to you? Would you describe this as good news because uh, licenses have been issued, but you have a condition to meet before you can operate uh, fully? Yeah, uh, assalamu alaikum, my sister Aisha. Alaikum <laughs> salam. I hope everybody is fine. <laughs> we and all do well. To the, 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 the colleague, colleague journalist. Once a journalist, always a journalist. Definitely. I've always said that no matter how disenchanted the old soldier is, we never shy away from the bara. <laughs> yeah. So um, on this matter, Aisha, um, without any shred of doubt, eh, it's good news. Even though uh, deleted as it may be, we wish this had happened earlier. And uh, 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 it could have contributed to further enhancing our structure as a democratic country, a democratic nation, uh, uh, embracing freedom of expression, the rule of law, and the fundamental human rights of all Ghanaians. But as I said, I think it is, it is good news. Let me first and foremost uh, uh, compliment to the uh, Communications Committee of Parliament. I can tell you without Aisha, without any shred of doubt, that if there has been one body that has contributed substantially to arriving at where we are today, it's the uh, uh, Communications Committee of Parliament. Indeed, when the radio stations were closed, the uh, uh, committee received petitions from a number of affected radio stations. And so it was under the aegis of the committee that we engaged the, the, the Ministry of Communications, headed by, by Honorable Osla Wusu, and then the National Communication Authority, as well as uh, uh, other stakeholders. Indeed, some of the radio stations, including Radio Gold, SYZ, Mantambo, and others, they brought uh, petitions before the, 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 the House. And Mr. Speaker referred those ones to the committee. And the committee accordingly took up those matters and convened a meeting. Indeed, we convened a meeting of the Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister Oslo Wusu, and she came with the NCA and East Top hierarchy, including the Director General and all the technical staff and others of the NCA. They were all present in Parliament. Initially, the initial hiccup we faced was that uh, Radio Gold, XYZ, and others had taken the matter to court. And because it was pending before the court of law, uh, the ministers indicated that her hands were tied. So following those revelations, we went into another meeting and persuaded Radio Gold, uh, uh, XYZ, and others to withdraw the case from court so that under the aegis of the committee we could uh, 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 go for a settlement. They, they obliged the committee's uh, 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 plea. We do the case. And we also took a, a, a concessions from the ministry that once the, the, the withdrawal was done, first application will be submitted and they will be considered as such and uh, frequencies to restore to them. 
So following those kinds of interventions, we got the work started. And actually, Radio Go we do submitted a press application as well as XYZ. And then the, the, the process commenced. Indeed, they got acknowledgement from the NCA that the application submitted has been uh, uh, formally uh, uh, taken on board and that it should be considered. So it was as a result of that that the work began. And then, unfortunately, what also slowed this down was the dissolution of the board and the delay in the constitution of the, constitution of the new board. Hello? Hello? Yes, you are still on. on, so, so, on. So, so what happened was that uh, uh, it, it went on up to a point where the boards were reconstituted. And in fact, this new board, when they took office, their first uh, uh, meeting at which this board uh, was convened to deal with issues of the NCA, this matter was brought before and expeditiously. They have considered it and given approval, and all those other radio stations have been restored. So mm. I want to say without any chance of doubt, that a number of stakeholders, starting on the committee from Honorable Kennedy at Japan, he was the first chairman uh, at the time this matter came up, and I was the ranking member. I'm mm. sure all of us uh, uh, put our heads together. I, I, I as ranking member, uh, 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 the issue, and he, as chairman, authorized that the matter should be dealt with. A committee meeting was called, and the committee as a whole sanctioned it. And then when he left, Honorable uh, Opare Asa, a former member of parliament, whom so, also took up. And we followed the matter too, and the committee was ab abreast with it and followed it too. Had consult constant consultations with the Honorable Minister, uh, Honorable Oslawusu, uh, and the uh, Director General of the NCA. And I want to commend all of them that it has been a partnership that has worked to ensure that the freedom of expression guaranteed in our constitution has been further enhanced with the inclusion of, of these bodies that were taken up. Either to if say me, um, of course, mm. you, 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 people, uh, the, the people had a right to read some political motives because. They knew that Radio Gold, XYZ, and others uh, uh, were critical of government. Mm. And in the run up to protest uh, elections, if this thing happened like that, anybody reading the, the political uh, 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 atmosphere would have no doubt mm. uh, uh, well, read some political motives into it. And so, yes, that happened. Especially so when people could point to uh, 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 allegations that some radio stations uh, uh, were, were also not fully compliant, mm. but, you know, they were allowed to function. All right. right. Uh, so uh, I, let me rest on. Uh, I want to make the point that even as uh, you may read it there on the deficit side of some other motives being read in tweet, mm. I must say unequivocally mm. that some of the radio stations, including Radio Gold and XYZ, also had a deficit on their side. Mm. They were supposed to make good their obligations in respect of paying, uh, in respect of paying frequency uh, 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 yearly. Okay. A lot of which have not been done. Okay. And so you recognize that even when they went to the electronic communications tribunal, the tribunal ruled that their failure to even meet those obligations made it, made, meant that they had ceased uh, 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 operating on those frequencies. Okay. And so the fines that the NCA had imposed on them were ruled as null and void because they, they did not exist in the first place. Okay. And so I must say without any doubt that many of those patients also had certain obligations they had fallen short of. Mm. And that is what created the, 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 the situation on both sides. Right. So um, this is a statement that was issued by the NCA. It indicated that the beneficiaries uh, include new applications from entities whose FM radio stations were closed down after the 2017 FM audit, as well as existing stations which applied for renewal of the expired FM radio broadcasting authorizations. In May 2019, and just as Saeed um, Fuseni alluded to, the NCA shut down Radio Gold, Radio XYZ, both based in Accra. Officials of the NCA stormed the premises of the station with armed security personnel while they were on air and ordered their immediate closure. They were then handed letters detailing the reason behind the order while asking them to reapply for licenses if they wished to operate as frequency modulation radio stations. And in two years line, down the line, the authority says it is ready to grant them broadcasting authorization, but subject to applicants attending a sensitization workshop on terms and conditions of FM radio broadcast authorizations. And in that statement, uh, it's explained that the provisional authorization shall be issued to the successful applicants at the end of the workshop and frequencies shall be assigned to applicants only upon the fulfillment of the conditions of the provisional authorization. So one will say, don't jubilate yet. 
Now, Andrew Ahinkra, Dansua Ahinkra, who is president of GEBA, has joined us for this conversation. Uh, Ms. Ahinkra, uh, what does this mean to these radio stations? All right, so thank you, Aisha. Um, the name is Dansua Ahinkra, and uh, I'm right. the president of GEBA. Right, um, so as you rightly put it, when you look at the statement that had been put out, indeed, um, it would be too early for anybody to take to the street in jubilation because when you try to understand the statements that had been put out, it gives you the impression that, number one, it is not probably about the radio stations that we are saying uh, or we are hoping would be giving their authorization to be back on air. Mm. Uh, Number one, when you look at the first um, paragraph of the particular statement, it talks about 133 FM radio broadcasting authorizations, um, which include new applications um, from entities. So what it means is that in actual fact, the 133 are just um, radio stations or let's say organizations, broadcasting organizations that have applied to the NCA. Mm. Uh, some may be those who had their authorization revoked as far back as 2017. Unfortunately, the National Communication Authority has not published the names of those 133 FM broadcasting stations that have been given their authorization. Number two, when you look at it again, you will realize that they are talking about certain conditions that have to be met before a provisional authorization is given. Um, which gives you the impression that failing to meet those conditions, which include a sensitization workshop, um, if you don't qualify, even during, so that you can even attend the sensitization workshop, but you have to qualify after attending the sensitization workshop. I don't know if they're going to write the exams there, but then there's that kind of qualification after you have attended the sensitization workshop. Um, then you'll be giving the provisional authorization. Again, the provisional authorization gives the impression that the authorization can be withdrawn. So when you look at it, it tells you that really um, it's just something which has been put out there to tease a reaction to find out how people are going to receive it. Um, as far as Giba is concerned, and we have also checked with our members, um, those who were affected, asked questions from them. As at yesterday, close of work yesterday, none of them have received any letter telling them that the authorization has been um, giving or they have even they've been invited to any workshop. We're wondering when that will be done. Um, that leaves us, it takes us back to where we were. What it means is that as far as we are concerned, nothing has been done. Mm. Um, it is reporting on some meeting and some decisions which have been taken on the meeting. That time. Okay. Um, so what's the role of GEBA in all of this? Uh, how are you taking this and how are you monitoring events? We are hopeful that the NCA will do the needful. Um, we have spoken to our members and we have asked them to exercise patience because all these years, since 2017, uh, we have exercised that patient. And so we would wait, giving ourselves up to Friday, um, hoping that the letters will be received. When the letters are received, we will take it from there. Um, if we don't get the letters, to, we would um, go into purpose and find out what we can do, and then we will take it up from Mm. Uh, Mr. Abia Fuseni, if you're still on, I want to find out from you, what do you want to see um, from now till the time the sensitization program is over and who gets the nod and who doesn't get the nod? What do you want to see as far as NCA is concerned? I, I, I want to believe that uh, the sensitization is only meant to ensure that the government uh, of uh, goods regulations the discount of the license will be made clear to all the, 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 the stations that are beneficiary. Mm. And then to also ensure that there will be a greater degree of compliance by, by, by the stations with the rules and regulations to uh, Nanchete. And, and that uh, uh, the NCA on this will also fulfill its obligations as a regulator so that it does not uh, uh, also become derelict, derelict of its duties. In respect of ensuring that uh, as soon as there is a possible infraction, they have a duty to point out that those potential or uh, clear infractions to the radio stations. 
so that they can make good their obligations. Asha, that the issue of the NCA being a regulator, it's not, it's not for them to uh, be uh, outwardly punitive, but it's for them to uh, help the radio stations to be compliant. So in, in, in cases where there is a potential breach by any uh, uh, radio station, they have a duty to point out to the radio station so that they can make good their, their obligations and stay. And so like uh, the criticism that was made in respect of the closure was not only because the radio stations were seen to be innocent. Like I said, some of them were, were in presence of some of their uh, 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 statutory obligations. But uh, it is the NCA does not uh, wait until those things pile up if they are seized. And then you bring millions of cities who clearly get to not pay. Uh -huh. And so the NCA must, on this part, also ensure that they, 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 they follow through and ensure that if uh, any uh, uh, radio station has a threat call, immediately they draw their attention so that they can rectify it and all of us be better safe so that uh, our rights of freedom of expression will be further enhanced as a democracy. Right. So um, I want you gentlemen to stay on for me uh, a bit longer on the media and how it is controlled and its control... Uh, if it's positively or negatively, how it can influence society. Uh, because we're told uh, that, I mean, there are a lot of things that, that we churn out on our media screens, especially for our kids. This week, a photo of our favorite Superman character popped up on social media. Instead of the joy with which Ghanaians usually greet that character, there has been a pushback. The reason is simple. Superman was now being depicted as a transgender. How much of that will influence your children? Well, we'll find out. And of course, uh, there's also this a picture for you to look at. Just take a look at this photo. It's another favorite comic character, Spider-Man on TV. This toddler watching this TV alone decides to emulate his idol. Imagine if Spider-Man actually jumps in the scene, such as the power of media influence on our society, especially on our children. How much of control does our regulators have and how much should they have in protecting the Ghanaian society? That's the focus also this afternoon for this conversation. Let me begin with you, Mr. ABA Fusseini. I mean, how does this come across to you, especially when we've had to go back and forth with this LGBTQ issue and with the bill which is currently in Parliament? Yeah, uh... Uh, I said, uh, for me, clearly, without any iota of doubt, it's an attempt to uh, use the back door to uh, especially uh, sensitize and get our youth, especially our children, to invite those kinds of uh, 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 what I would call uh, uh, untoward values. Clearly, I said, the thing is, is to make sure that in watching those things, uh, you've come to accept that the, this issue of gender transformation and moving from one gender to other, they, they become the gender tolerant. They become tolerant of those uh, 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 things that they see. And in becoming tolerant, it becomes part of their, it becomes part of their value. And then they grow up accepting that it is okay to be trans, it's okay to be gay, it's okay to be lesbian, it's, it's okay to be queer. Uh, 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 things that are inimical growth and development of our society and to our values as Ghanaians and African people. So clearly, I, I, I see all these other things in this uh, 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 ICT era that we live in. They will use all manner of surreptitious means to get us. You remember not too long ago, Aisha, we had a debate in this country of comprehensive sexuality education as part of our curriculum, in which they were trying to infuse this kind of thing in, in our children. And, but for the resistance, the society put up. It will have been part of the curriculum being taught in our schools. And so now they will try to smuggle that through other media that our children uh, patronize. And in this day and age, because uh, we have this uh, uh, media uh, uh, plurality and this variety of uh, medium they can use to send pictures to our children, they, 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 they are passing it through. So I see this one as just nothing but an attempt to get our children uh, uh, embrace and embed this uh, uh, LGBT QI, uh, 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 terrible, uh, 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 this is that they are trying to infuse into our, our, our country and our culture. And the best way of getting them is to catch the children when they are young. And that is why they are, they, they, uh, some of these things that the children patronize, they want to use that one as a basis to infuse 
that quarter in them. And I think that we must all be alive. I want to take this opportunity of your, your very uh, respectable video to call on parents to be very, very, very uh, up at doing and circumspect in what their children watch and to ensure that they, they moderate and regulate uh, 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 this uh, media that, that their children patronize and, and the content that comes with it so that they can stop them from this uh, kind of uh, negative content that unduly is targeted at influencing their culture and uh, uh, adulterating their, 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 their uh, way of life, uh, which is not African and which is not edifying. I think that uh, parents have a bounding duty to be very interested in what their children watch, especially now that we are living through this very dangerous time. Uh, Mr. Danso and in Christ still with us. Mr. Danso, how much control do we have, especially on foreign content? I mean, we're talking about the DSTVs, the Go TVs, and all the things that they bring in. Some time ago, we heard about the classification of even documentaries before it is shown. But these are foreign contents on channels that we do not have control over. Yeah, so I think um, as time goes on, we would come to the point where we'll be able to define what we mean by foreign content. Um, are we talking about African content? Are we talking about Ghanaian content? Are we talking about West African content? Are we talking about international content? Are we talking about Mexican soaps? Are we talking about Indian soaps? Are we talking about Korean? So um, we should be able to come to that point uh, in our discourse in time define, clearly define what we mean when we talk about foreign content. That is very important. Um, I believe strongly that with the moves that have initiated, especially spearheaded by the Ministry of Information um, with other stakeholders, we will gradually get there. Again, when we have succeeded in passing uh, the broadcasting bill, uh, the broadcasting law, we would find enough room and support for some of the activities that we intend undertaking for the purpose of um, helping to regulate um, what we use as content on our various uh, television platforms. Uh, again, as we evolve, I mean, society is dynamic. We move forward virtually every day. When we get the opportunity of um, changing technology, that would inform us also concerning our laws and our regulations. We'll be able to invite in the people who turn out this um, content also um, the desire to have uh, various jurisdictions well represented in the content that we show on our television. Mm. It should be a conversation, there should be a common platform where we can have a conversation um, that will be ongoing and that would also take into consideration. What, what was the role of Giba in this conversation you're talking about? I mean, what do you intend to do about this? Because it looks like it's becoming very critical. Well, so Giba has always uh, managed to put together its members, make sure that we have the people even identified. Um, for instance, if you play in an industry where you cannot identify the players, it is very difficult to put information across to them. GIBA will continue to provide that platform where if anybody wants to address um, players in the industry, television owners especially, radio owners especially, uh, GIBA will be the mouthpiece. GIBA will continue to rally um, these people together and then will also be available to contribute our quota in terms of knowledge, know-how. Um, we have an association which has membership which cuts across uh, people who have traveled, people who have um, learned a lot locally, we'll be able to lend support, we'll be able to contribute our knowledge in shaping out whatever we want to put across and make sure that we get to where we want to. Mm. I'm grateful for your time, Andrew Danso and Nkora. He is the president of uh, GIBA and uh, ABA Fuseni is a member of parliament and ranking member on the communication committee of parliament. I'm extremely grateful for your time this afternoon. We'll take a break on the pulse and we'll bring you the very latest from the sports world. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for staying with us here on the Joy News channel. And we are here with a Brazilian. A Brazilian 
not one of those Brazilians that Santo Kotoko brought in the heyday that many people make fun of. It is a Brazilian who finally has cracked how to impress Ghanaians. Ghanaians have always seen themselves as the Brazilians of Africa. And Fabio Gama arrived in Ghana with a whimper, but he's ending the league season very much with his chest held up and his head very much up in the skies. He's here to talk to us, and it's a pleasure to speak to you, Fabio Gama. Good day to you, and how are you doing? Uh, good morning, so I'm good. You? I'm fine, thank you as well. Um, how are you finding off-season? Yeah, I find well. So I'm sure that we could do better, but I'm happy what we did. So this season was very tough, but could go try the best. And that's make me proud. Are you relaxing? Yeah, yes, I am. Oh, you are. You know, sometimes off season, some of you players, you like to do your own training and stuff, or you are relaxing for now. Yeah, for now I'm relaxing because you know the the season is tough. So now I want time to to rest well, and after that I will start training again. You you will start your own personal training? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, would you be in Ghana throughout the off season or you go home and cool off a little? Yes, I'll go home. I'm back to Brazil, so because I need to enjoy my my parents, my loved ones a little bit, my my friends, so it would be a good time to rest and come back much strong to Ghana. If they ask you what kind of country Ghana is, what will you say? <laughs> I don't know, Ghana is it's a good country, so the people they are very very like workers so they are survivors, so that's how the life is so Ghana for me, I don't have any complaints, just enjoy it. I've been to Brazil also I was there for the World Cup for about one month mm -hmm. Rio is is like. Accra times three, always fast, always quick, no dull moment. <laughs> but you don't live in Rio, in Brazil? No, no, I don't live in Rio. I live in Salvador. Which is very chill and calm. Yeah, it's... It's, it's like Kumasi. No, it's, it's more, how I say, it's more strong than Kumasi. Yeah. The people, uh, they just stop. They are all the time running, all the time... Uh, busy. Busy, and uh, try to fix your own things. So it's like, is... it's like Yakra, I think. They are running all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, Ghana has treated you well, obviously. I mean, you've enjoyed your time here. Anytime I've hear, heard you speak, you talk about how cool the people are, the team is. You've played in many, many teams. If you compare with Asante Kotoko in every way, how different is Asante Kotoko from the teams you have played in Brazil and then Europe and then Asante Kotoko? The difference is, um, if you see the football is the same everywhere. Like, um, it's 11 against 11. So, Kotoko is a great team in Ghana, like team that I played in Brazil and I played in Sweden, in Europe. So, of course, there is some things that they have to fix and they are trying the quote unquote board is more small they are trying to to give to the players to the players the best so but it's the same like Kotoko is big I play in big teams in Brazil and the treatment is, is not so different it's good Let, let's talk about Sweden when you were you were coming to Ghana um, most of us had never heard of you. So we did, we, did, we did what we would normally do. We go on Google, check your videos, mm -hmm. check your statistics. We're like, yeah, I mean, he's not, he's not extraordinary. So in your own words, Fabio, why do you think it didn't really work out for you in Sweden? I've been in Sweden for two years. So it was a good time. I, I learned too much in Sweden like football tactics, like uh, how 
the players need to learn to understand the game. So this was very, very important for me. And when I came to Ghana, and it was more easy to adapt it on the Ghanaian football, to understand. Yeah, yeah. So you are saying that Sweden was a learning process for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What positions were you comfortable or did you play really in Sweden? I play like a, a, a midfielder, like I, 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 I come playing with Mariano. I play like a midfielder on the, the right side, the same position. And sometimes, and like number 10 as well. Okay, right. So obviously, when you came to Ghana, at what points did you hear that people were saying, I mean, this guy is not special? When did you hear it? Before you came or after you came? Yeah, since the first day that Kotoko announced my name, I, I started hearing this. But, uh, how I say before, I try to do my best to prove that they are wrong about me. And in the final, I was right. You know, I was one of those who said, you know Kotoko, the way Kotoko is, it's like um, Sao Paulo, Gremio, the big teams. Yeah. The hype players. And Kotoko, even if they get an average player, they are going to hype their player. So when you were coming, I was one of those who said, everybody, like, calm down. We have not seen Fabio Gama play, so don't hype this guy, right? But obviously, you know Kotoko have a history of bringing Brazilians already to Ghana, and they did, they did not do well. So it didn't help your reputation even before mm -hmm. you came. How did that talk, or what did it do to you? Did it hurt you? Did, it, did you take it normally? How, what did it do to you? The feeling is, in the beginning, is bad because they, know, they don't know you, how you said, and they speak, uh, they start speak bad things about you, and even they don't know you. So you start thinking how they can do this. But when I, I heard it the first time, so I try just uh, give all my heart for Kotoko and prove that they are wrong because I came and I can improve myself and this is, it was very important for me. So all the haters, uh, they, they give me more strong to be, to make my, my way more, more easy. And at the same time, this make me strong. In your own words, do you think that you have finished this season as one of the top players in Ghana right now? Yeah, I'm sure that. No, because I am saying that. Because the people are saying that. Because when you are good, the people start say good things. When you are not good, the same thing happens. So I'm saying, no, because it's my words, but because all the Ghana is saying that. So we can't lie. <laughs> But you, yourself, do you think you are one of the top players in the Ghana Premier League right now? Yeah, I'm sure that. Yeah, maybe top two, top three, top five, top ten? Top one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But, you know, um, I'm a member of the Ghana Football, Ghana Football Awards they did. You saw the posters, right, for the awards they did. And we nominated you as one of the top eight players for the season. Mm -hmm. It was so competitive. Actually, let me tell you a story. We actually wanted to nominate only top three. But when we did the, the list, we decided to do top five. And then we did, no, it's not good enough. So we decided to do all the top eight. My point is that this season, we had a lot of very, very good players. Yes, the, of course. In the Ghana Premier League. Yeah. Away from you, you think you are the top one or whatever. Which other players do you genuinely think Look, these guys, when whether I say, they are in Kotoko or elsewhere. When I say that, I say because uh, we have many good players so in Ghana. In my mind, I will be on, always in the first, the top. So we have a good player. We have Bokie from Wafa. Augustin uh, Boache. Yes. We have Salifu Ibrahim, very good. We have the number 10 from 
Great Olympics. Glatinawako. Yeah, so they are very, we have Ganil from Kotoko, Mudaziru. So we have many, many good players. It's impossible you, you choice only three or five or ten options yeah. because we have too much more than this. You understand? Yeah, yeah. Now, if you look at the, the players that you have mentioned, some are defenders, some are midfielders, obviously some are strikers as well. Do you get the impression that Ghana has a very solid league compared to some of the places you have played in? Yes, I'm sure that. Because when they, when they see how the, the season finish, you see the high level of the players, you have sure that. Now, one big thing everywhere is the media. The media. Um, the media hype the league, they hype players, they hype matches. How have you enjoyed the Ghanaian media? I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't care too much about the media. Because all the time they are speaking about you, or being good or bad things. So I try just no be involved too much with this. So because of this, I don't use too much media. Catch the full interview with Fabio Gama on the Join News channel at 8.15 tomorrow. You don't have to miss this. And that's how we wrap up the bulletin on the polls this afternoon. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. For more news, log on to myjoinline.com. You'll get updates of all the developing stories. Up next is Let's Talk Showbiz. Enjoy the rest of our programs.